Amen, amen. Hey, take your Bibles and open up to Mark 6. This is where we left off last week. If you were here at the 8 a.m. service, you know I lost my voice by the end of service. Wasn't that rad? No, it wasn't rad at all. I think I just hadn't had enough water. I just, man, I drank as much as I could and bone broth and hit honey lemon and all this stuff, and I was able to get through the rest of the service. And then we went and baptized four people at Nye Beach. It was so radical. Keanu, yeah, praise God. Keanu had come to the 8 a.m. service and he wanted to get baptized. When we got to Nye Beach, his younger brother, Huey, was there. I'd never met either one of these boys. They're visiting with their grandma, Janice. And Huey was there. I said, Huey, are you getting baptized too? He's like, no, not today. And I said, why not? He's like, I don't know. I said, well, think about it, bro. You know, the water's as warm as it's ever gonna get and it was not warm, man. It was like 49. It was bad. And then while I was telling this, while we were going through the teaching on baptism, another girl, Chandra, showed up from one of the services. I want to get baptized. And there was another girl there named Levine. She got baptized. We all went out there. It was so radical. People getting baptized and identifying with Jesus Christ. That was last Sunday. And we left off last Sunday with the disciples. There was another one who got baptized. Peter, when he walked on water and he had his eyes on Jesus and then he got all weird and focused on the winds and the waves and he himself got baptized and sank in the Dead Sea or the Sea of Galilee and Jesus healed him. Look at verse though. I'll get there. 53. It says that when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. And they ran through the whole country and the surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Stop right there, eyes up here. This is so legendary. Jesus gets to Gennesaret, and as soon as he's there, everybody recognizes him, which, by the way, is the goal of the church, that the church would elevate and present Jesus Christ to the world, not present authors and pastors and teachers and musicians and all the rest. We tend to have a stardom of Christianity, and who's your favorite pastor, and what's your favorite church, and what's your favorite song, and all those are good and well-intended. But the intention of all of those vehicles is to get Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It says when they got to Gennesaret, everyone recognized Jesus. They might have recognized Peter too. Hey, there's Peter. He's soaking wet. What happened to Peter? He's like, don't ask. You know, like, get, forget about it. Like, look at Jesus. And I just got to say that maybe to me primarily, but to all of us collectively, the goal of the church is to make sure everybody has access to Jesus and make sure that you know you have access to Jesus. I love being most of your friends. I know most of you here and I love all of you, but I don't have enough time for every single person here. Jesus does though. Jesus has enough time for every single person here and the 10 a.m. and the 12 a.m. and all the other churches and all the people in our community that don't go to church and all the people in our world and the whole universe. It's all about Jesus, not about you, not about me. That's refreshing to me. But do you remember the course that they went through to get here? There was a series of events. First, they were working hard and there wasn't enough food and provision. And so there was the miracle of the bread. This was taught to them on purpose. Do you know why? Because as they would continue their ministry, they're going to stress, you are too. They're going to fret, you are too. They're going to worry, so are you. Is there gonna be enough? Lord, are you gonna provide for my needs? And Jesus let them run out of everything they had, give to them what they did have, five loaves and two fish. And he said, that's enough. Because he wanted to teach them a lesson. There's going to be a need for God to provide every single thing you need for the rest of your life. Somebody say amen. Amen. What this does for you and me, it helps us to settle in then to the unknown. I don't know how this is gonna work out. Lord, I don't know how retirement's gonna look for me. Lord, I don't know how the off-ramp's gonna go. I don't know what's gonna happen. Most of you don't know. I don't know. Even this morning, I was thinking about a few things in my life, unknown variables, and I just chose, I, I told the Lord, Lord, I choose to trust you. Lord, actually, this is really, this, in all sense, this is not good, but Lord, I need, I need you to bring increase here. You do it right here. Would you please, Lord, I, I sense that you're going to do that. Lord, you do it, and I believe he's gonna do it. And that miracle was unnatural. It wasn't normal, on purpose. Not just was the miracle of provision, but then there was the miracle of protection. Immediately after that, they were fired up. They got in the boat and they almost died. You don't need to raise your hands, but have you guys almost died before? I've almost died so many times. I can't believe I'm still here. It's crazy. And yet God protected me every single time. 
And we need to believe that when I get into a situation that I'm in over my head, water's coming in the boat. I've been rowing for what feels like all night long. And I've only got three or four of the 11 miles across the sea I need to go. I'm in trouble. Lord says, I'll provide for you. I'll provide for you and I'll protect you in the storm. And not only did he provide and protect, but then also he gave power to heal in this next portion of scripture. Everyone in this portion, they bring people from all the highways and the byways and all the crevices of the community. They say, Jesus is here. Get everybody in need. This should be a picture of the church, shouldn't it? That Jesus is there, so everybody with a need shows up. The church should be full of needy people, full of people that need a spiritual hospital. Why are Jesus is at that church? Give, let me go. That's why you guys are here at 7.59 in the morning. You guys know there's Jesus and he's here and he's gonna minister to you. And we need to understand something. None of this is natural. This is all supernatural. This is why Jesus' fame was growing. This is why men and women were flocking to meet him. This is why you've chosen and I've chosen as well to give my life and to die my death for his glory and for others' good. I'm gonna run my race for Jesus because I trust in him. He's gonna provide, he's gonna protect, he's gonna bring power. But let's acknowledge one more time the storms. Why are we going through storms? Why does this happen? Storms happen for a number of different reasons. We sometimes bring storms upon ourselves. These are what we call storms of correction, where you do something silly and you find yourself dealing with silly consequences, play silly games, get silly prizes. Someone say, hey, man, you know. Man, you find yourself doing this. The Lord says, oh, I'll put you in this storm on purpose to get your attention. The prime example of this is Jonah. Jonah ran from God's will. He's like, I'm gonna take care of it. I'm gonna dodge this anointing on my life. And he got himself a cruise and went cruising. And pretty soon he's getting swimming lessons. And he's getting swallowed by a whale. You guys know this story. It was a storm. Why, why did this storm happen? To correct him. Not to do him in, not to punish him, but God was trying to get him where he wanted him to go. I'm so thankful for the storms that arise in my life. Where it says, Luke, I'm not done with you. I'm chasing you. I'm never gonna let you go. You did this to yourself. It's a storm of correction. There's also storms of direction. You're not doing anything wrong at all. You're doing your best. D-T-N-R-T. And I'm gonna T-T-P. Do the next right thing and trust the process. And all of a sudden, something goes crazy. Maybe the business you work for goes under and you get fired. Maybe something goes wrong in the school system or something goes wrong in your community or family. Am I getting punished? And the Lord says, no, I'm actually using this to direct you. I'm closing a door. It feels like a storm for you, but I'm closing this door because Father knows best. Either way, storms of direction or correction or protection or perfection, I could go on and on and on. All of them give us an opportunity to say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I fully trust you. Isn't it so fun just to fully trust? You gotta confess that sometimes. Lord, I trust you. I don't know what to do. And what God is doing in every single storm is he's refining your faith, making it more pure. You have a little bit of faith? Cool, that's awesome, so do I. God says, I want that faith to be more pure. It'd be like taking a raw nugget of gold found from the mountainside of a huge mine. And as you pull this nugget of gold, it's not ready to be used. It needs to be refined. It needs to be cooked down. That the drosses would be exposed and removed and done away with and the impurities burned off through fire and through trial. And it's an old illustration. You've all heard it before that when the silversmith takes gold or silver and burns it down, the dross comes to the service, is removed, and then he cools it down. Oh, man, don't you love when the Lord cools down the storm? Let's go. And then he puts it right back in the fire. What are you doing? He does it again and again and again because there's more hidden dross. There's more hidden imperfections. And they always come to the service and they're burned away until finally the silversmith knows that the job is fully complete when he can see his perfect reflection in that molten silver. The illustration is amazing. Did you know God is wanting, that's his goal, is to when he looks at you, he sees a reflection of himself, that you're more like Jesus and less like Luke Frechette, more like who you are naturally. You're becoming purified. Why? I feel like I'm getting heated up again. He's like, oh yeah, there's some stuff coming out. And then when you get heated up and when I get heated up, are you ever surprised at what comes out of you? Your spouse isn't. Your parole officer isn't. You know, like, oh yeah, we saw that coming. He was like, what? Oh, there it is. And he says, yeah, I'm doing this on purpose. The storms of life are designed to refine you and perfect you and cause your roots to grow down deeper. We talked about all this last week. 
So don't reject those things in your life that you're dealing with right now. Instead, say, Lord, have your way. Make me more like you. Let's go ahead and study verse by verse. And like I said, we're getting into verse 23 of chapter seven, so y'all better buckle up because we got some stuff to do. Verse 53 says, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. Two things that stick out to me, they crossed over. They thought they were gonna die. God hasn't brought you this far just to bring you this far. You're going to cross over as well. You're going to make it to your intended destination. Relax and do the next right thing. And when they got there, they anchored. This would have been so good to anchor in and finally have stability. Sometimes I feel like I'm just getting banged around and drifting and all over the place. These guys, though, were led this far, not just to be lost at sea, but to get to their intended port. Verse 54, and when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized Jesus. Job well done, boys. They're elevating the Christ. And then they ran through the whole surrounding region, verse 55, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Stop right there, eyes up here. Mark's really good at giving details to what was going on. Peter is telling him the story. I bet Peter was a good talker. And so when Peter started getting excited about certain events and certain details, Mark probably said, well, that was, Peter got real excited. This must've been crazy. When they showed up, people saw Jesus and they began to get, I'm gonna call it very creative in the ways that they got people to meet Jesus. They went all around the surrounding region and brought Jesus to, or brought people to wherever Jesus was. As if Jesus was on mission, one day he's at Starbucks and hanging out, and the other day he's at Ultra Life, and then he's at Grocery Outlet, and he's hanging out at Moe's, Ch- he's doing all these things, and people are like, he's, he's at Moe's, let's go, and they're bringing people to him. And I just had to stop, and I've been med- meditating on verse 55 all week long, because it just makes me happy, that these people were excited to let people meet Jesus. This church is right around 14 years old. In two weeks, we'll have our 14, actually this uh, next Monday, we'll have our 14-year anniversary, South Beach Church. My wife and I moved here in 2010, August 29th. And we have done our very, very best, the whole church, we've done our very, very best to make Jesus uh, available to all of Lincoln County, wherever people are. We've done radio ads. We do social media with YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. We've done mailers, sent over 9,000 A mailers out one time inviting people to our Converge service where we rented the high school and set things up and baptized dozens of people in the high school. We got in a lot of trouble for that. She was awesome. You know, we just, we've done everything. We've done parades and we do hope in the park and all kinds of things with the hope and desire. Are there anybody in Lincoln County that needs Jesus? Someone say amen. Somebody needs, this takes creativity. It takes resources. It takes sacrifice it takes faith and as i see it in verse 55 i'm like man that must have been so cool in gennesaret it was a revival and those in need they knew they were in need and they heard about jesus and i want to have that continued same attitude methodology and mentality at south beach church in this church and in the church that god's given us on the hill that we're going to do everything we can within our power while we're here on earth to make sure jesus is available to every single person a city on a hill that cannot be hidden God's given us the best land in town. It's visible from Clearwater right across the street, right across the bay. From, the, from 101, you can see the ocean. It's outside a tsunami zone, 12 acres plus, surrounded by the college there and dorms and apartments and houses. Why is God doing all this? Because Jesus goes where the people are and he wants to be available to them. So can I stir up the evangelist inside of you? The one who knows Jesus, you're saved, you're going to heaven, but God wants to use you in other people's lives to sweeten the message of Jesus, to invite them to church. If your life, like my life, has been changed radically by Jesus Christ, you are now on mission, and God's going to uniquely and specifically put you in the lives of other people so you might invite them to church, invite them to know Jesus through the relationship they have with you. This is exactly what was going on in Gennesaret years and years ago. Look at verse 56. It says, wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country. That's such great detail. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. This is so fun. Right after they almost starved to death. Right after they almost drowned. Okay? Right after they were bombarded with crowds. The pressure is immense but the provisions are more immense. God says, I have led you this far and I will provide all of your needs. Don't slow down. Don't take your foot off the gas. People need Jesus. Interesting, it says in this particular story that they grabbed all of the sick people and that they could find. Can you imagine that just running? Are you sick? Come on, the healers here. All the sick people. This is how the church should be. It should be full of sick people. 
people that can't figure it out, people that are all messed up, people that are addicted to drugs, people that are addicted to alcohol, people that are all messed up, they should be flocking to the church. I need help. And I believe South Beach Church has modeled this well, saying, yeah, every single person is welcome to come to find Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ loves the whole world. Interesting what it says here, those who reached out to the hem of his garment were healed. We remembered in a few chapters previous, the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years crawled through the crowd as they were pressing on him and just said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. But that's crazy faith right there, isn't it? If she didn't, she was healed. We studied all that. Now they're doing the same thing. I'm not gonna try and piece this together too much, but in the Jewish culture, the men, especially rabbis, would have long robes and they would have tassels around the hem of their garment and these strings that would come down with all kinds of beads and cool stuff and they were blue in nature. And they were intended, according to the Old Testament, to remind the Jewish children, the men and women, that our home is in heaven. Blue is the color of heaven, according to the Bible. And they were to remind us that we're just sojourners passing through. This isn't our earthly home. Can you imagine these people hear about Jesus and they reach out to the healer, to the hem of his garment, and they touch just a little bit of the power of heaven and receive healing. This is so miraculous. Some people would like to take this and make a formula out of it. Well, you need to get some tassels and touch the tie. You know, this is how you do it. And I'm of the persuasion that God does what God's gonna do. He tells us, you and me, that we have not because we ask not that we're to pray for those who are sick, those who need healing. I've got oil in my pocket. I didn't have any oil today. I found a little vessel in the green room there and filled it feverishly, I anointed myself with oil that I'd be filled with his Holy Spirit today. And I believe that when you lay hands on somebody and ask God to heal, that God has the power to heal. It's happened dozens of times here at this church. I also believe that as you reach out to God, the hem of his garment, you say, Lord, would you heal me? That God also says, not yet. Not yet. And sometimes our healing doesn't come in the physical the way we want. We've all seen this. We've all experienced this. Sometimes the Lord says, your healing will come when you actually get to heaven. But when you reach out and touch me, heaven will come to you. Can I just say this to those of you who are suffering in any way or need physical or emotional healing? Reach out to Jesus. When you set your mind on things above, like it says in Colossians chapter 3, not on things below, you immediately are transferred to heaven in the, in the spirit. God touches your life. And he gives to you and he gives to me the peace that passes understanding. And he knows best for your life and he knows best for my life. In this particular scene, everybody's getting healed. In our lives, I believe that God has called us to walk by faith. Some healings are given. Sometimes the Lord says, not yet. But here's a download. Here is a investment of heaven into your life, the Holy Spirit, as you focus on him. So many things we could draw out of this portion of scripture, but I want you to join me now in verse seven. Buckle up, I'm not looking forward to teaching this portion. I just wish we could keep talking about Jesus and all the fun things he was doing. Look at the first word in chapter seven, verse one. Then. There wasn't a chapter seven in the original writing that Mark gave. The translators added this. They said, hey, let's put a chapter break here so that way we can kind of divide the chapters. But according to my reading, it just keeps going. While this is happening in Gennesaret, while the revival's going on and people's lives are being changed, I'll just read it to you. It says, then the Pharisees and some of the scribes, they came together to him having come from Jerusalem. And now when they, had, when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. And then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, saying, hey, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Stop right there, eyes up here, just one side note. Mark wrote his gospel, there's four gospels. Mark's primary audience was the Romans. The Romans didn't really care about Jewish traditions or customs, they didn't understand them, they didn't want to. So Mark adds these little details about these guys who were offended at Jesus. Why were they so mad at Jesus? Well, he wasn't washing his hands before he eats. Let's just uh, pull the crowd right now. How many of you guys like to wash your hands before you eat? Everyone else is savage. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. You should wash your hands before you eat. It's 2024, man. Come on. I got sanitizer on one side, ketchup on the other, man. Wash your hands. But in these days, 
they would wash their hands to get rid of the germs. That's no, no big deal. They didn't know about the germs that we know about, but they would still, they had some measure of cleanliness. But this particular washing, Mark tells us, it was a special washing. It had nothing to do with if your hands were dirty. As a matter of fact, you would wash your hands for the filth and the dirt and the germs. Then before you ate, you would go through a ceremonial washing of the hands. It had nothing to do with cleanliness. You would actually take one and a half eggshells of water. It was specific in nature. Not more, not less, just that amount. And you would have somebody pour it over your palms and your hands and it would run down your elbows and you would do this ceremonially, washing yourself from the filth of the world and the filth of the Gentiles, establishing yourself as different and better than the rest of the world. Then you would go ahead and eat at the beginning of a meal. And if you were really serious, you would do it at the beginning of every part of the meal. So at the beginning, after the salad, and then at the rest of the encore, and then the dessert, you'd keep washing your hands ceremonial as if you were... <laughs> Bring the water, you know, and you get, have somebody pour it on you. And Jesus didn't do this. Jesus shows up. He's like, anybody hungry? Let's see. You guys think they were washing their hands with the 5,000 feeding? The, you think they were doing that? This was so serious. Matter of fact, there's some historical uh, rabbis. One rabbi actually was arrested by the Romans, and he was tortured and all the rest for being a Jew. And he was given rations of water every single day to, to survive. But instead of drinking it, he would wash his hands with it, and he almost died because he was so serious about the law. I shouldn't say the law, about traditions, that he didn't drink the water. And he was put down in history as a hero of the Jewish faith. And people would not do this from time to time and they'd be excommunicated as rabbis. You can't be a leader anymore. You didn't wash ceremonially. Jesus shows up in the midst of a revival and he's like, I'm not doing that. Neither are my boys. And the guys from Jerusalem, which by the way, let me just give them a little attaboy. Their job was to monitor the situation. Their job was to make sure that no cuckoos were coming in and teaching crazy stuff and taking people down the wrong path. This was their job. They were supposed to make sure that the law was being taught accurately and the people were being cared for properly. So when they showed up, they looked at Jesus and they noticed a couple things. Number one, they noticed everyone's being healed. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Number two, they heard about the story of Jesus walking on water and Peter too, that's mind blowing. Number three, they'd also just heard about the story where Jesus healed or, or provided food for thousands of people. Yet in light of all that, verse one of chapter seven says, then the Pharisees got all bungled up in their minds, all displeased. This freaks me out. It makes me laugh a little bit that they couldn't see the obvious of what was going on and celebrate. Something must be happening here. Obviously, it must be okay that we don't take one and a half eggshells of water and wash our hands and eat and get God's favor. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening. Or, listen, the problem with legalism, we're talking about legalism being a Pharisee today, the dangers, it's not what they were doing. They were supposed to do this, but the way they did it was off. Two, two ways specifically, write this down, hopefully it's practical for you. Two ways that this became off and they become judgmental and sin sniffy and the religious regulators. And the reason this happened, it's for two reasons primarily. Number one, they already made up their mind about Jesus. They'd already made up their mind. They didn't like him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to do him. They were looking for bad. And when you look for bad in somebody's life, you know what you're gonna find? Bad. It's just the facts. When you already made up your mind, I don't like the way this guy dresses. I don't like the way this girl lives. I don't like the way that church does these things. I promise you, you're gonna find nothing but dissatisfaction and things that offend you in that person. That's what you're gonna do, so don't do that. Number two, not only did they already make up their mind, their minds were closed. Number two, they weren't, oh, this is more important than number one, they weren't using God's word as the baseline. Did you know in God's word, it doesn't say to take one and a half eggshells of water and ceremonially cleanse yourself before you eat? It doesn't say that. There was some inspiration in the book of Leviticus for the priest before they would worship the Lord in the Holy Temple, but they took this in widespread. So let's all do that. Let's add to, we're gonna call it the traditions and the legalism of what God has already given to us. We're really good at this, by the way. It's gonna be fun picking on the Pharisees because I don't know any of them 2,000 years ago. They're all dead and gone. You know, Some of them got saved and it's gonna be real easy to identify that, but you and I have a tendency to all kind of fall into our favorite tradition. Tradition. You know, we, we all do that. Did you know that in this day, God gave them their, his word, which is enough. There's so much in his word. It's all we need. But they added to his word. I don't want to go into too great of details, but there was two books that they had coinciding with the Old Testament at this time, the Talmud and the Mishnah. The Talmud and the Mishnah, which were the rabbis, as they read God's word, they said, that's awesome. Mind if we add to it? Can you imagine if you just decided to add to God's word? Do you think it's going to make him mad? I think it's going to make him mad. They added to God's word and they wrote the Talmud and the Mishnah. The Talmud is 1.8 million words long. 
and it's what the rabbis over the years decided. That's what God must have meant when he said what he said. But he already simply said what he said simply. God's word is enough. Sometimes people ask me from time to time, Luke, do you ever read the book of Enoch? Do you ever read the book of Thomas? Do you ever read? I'm like, no, I don't read any of that crap. Can you say crap in church? Because we just did. <laughs> Why don't you read that crap, they say. I said, because I got 66 books I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around right here. I don't need other stuff. Until you can cite chapter and verse every single book and every single passage in the Bible, don't veer outside of it. You don't need anything else. Well, the Talmud, 1.8 million words about what it must mean when God said to do this, what it must mean. And then they went even further, and the mission has 63 different volumes all contributed into one. This is how it's gotta be when you live. They went crazy, though, and there's quotes. Eliezer, one of the priests, old, old priests, one of the uh, back-in-the-day rabbis, he said that if you veer outside of the Talmud and the Mishnah at all, you're not worthy of the life to come. They established and elevated their traditions and their laws and their likes and their want tos, their preferences became prejudices more so than God's word. Now, I wanna make this practical for us because I don't think it's gonna be beneficial for us just to pick on these guys, but we have the same tendency to do that with our traditions. You like the certain way that you worship. You probably come into church here most likely because you like some of the things unless you're a spy sent by another church. Just kidding. You probably like the way we worship. You probably like, but you've noticed that we kind of break some of the traditions of mankind. It's not traditional, most of you know, for a pastor to wear jeans and a t-shirt. Someone say, (laughs) it's not traditional. Over the years, one of my highest compliments I've received is, you don't look like a pastor. I'm like, thank you. I try really hard not to look like a pastor because of some of the traditions that we fall in and it's gotta be this way and that way. And let me just, again, be nice. You're allowed to have your preferences. Man, I really like to worship God with guitars and drums and pianos. I like it. But once you say, oh, you go to a church that uses hymns, hymnals and an organ, oh, man. And you then begin to criticize and judge people that like to worship with hymnals and organs, your preference can then become a prejudice and you find yourself, oh, becoming a legalizer, a Pharisee, a sin sniffer, and a religious regulator. And when you do those things, you find yourself on the fast track to being a joyless person, to taking God's job from him. You and I don't know enough about the situation. We don't know enough about hearts. Can you imagine? These guys blew it so bad. They show up. People are getting healed by the thousands. Revivals happen. And one guy's like, I didn't see Jesus wash his hands. I say we kill him. You know, like what? And they kill him. Not right here, but he would die for breaking the traditions of the Jewish people at that time. So they ask these questions. They're offended in this way. Primarily, they had already preconceived ideas, which we do this too. It doesn't take long for you and I to judge somebody. We see a church doing something or an author or a pastor, even somebody who's not a Christian. We're pretty smart and we make the mistake of thinking we have all the details and all the insight. We don't. Our ideas are made up careful of doing that. But primarily, they weren't using God's word. What did God's word? Well, he didn't say to do it the way that they wanted to. As a matter of fact, God's word's so important. Look at Jesus' answer Verse six, long answer, a lot of red here. Uh, Mark primarily focuses on what Jesus did, but in this next passage, he's gonna focus on what Jesus taught. Matthew, in his book, primarily talks about what Jesus taught. So Mark's gonna get a little theological with us right now as he recounts this story. Verse six, Jesus answered and said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Them is fighting words. As it is written, by the way, before I read this, can I just... They're mad at Jesus for breaking the tradition. Jesus immediately retaliates, listen, by quoting the word. Oh, Jesus could have gotten mad at them and said how dumb they were and this and that, but instead he goes right to the word of God. If you don't have the word of God to back up your preference that has possibly become a prejudice, okay, just be quiet. Just sit in your own little prejudice, it's okay. Have your preference, that's all right, but don't go to anybody else and tell them they're doing it wrong unless you have chapter and verse and are able to cite it with love. When Jesus called them hypocrites, that sounds unloving, but I believe he wanted to get their attention. That word hypocrite is actually a Greek word used to describe a play actor. Somebody who in those days, hypocrites was the word, they would take a mask and put it over their face to hide who they really were. He said, that's what you guys are doing. On the outside, you're trying to look good, which by the way, we're all doing our best to look good on the outside. It's just human nature. But there's also something insidious inside of us that doesn't want people to know what's really going on. And I, want, I actually want you, maybe you're the same, I want you to think I'm more spiritual than I actually am. 
Just me? Anyways. <laughs> because we all have a hypocritical side in us. And Jesus said, oh, so you washed your hands so you're more spiritual than everyone? <laughs> Interesting. I didn't know that's how it worked. Uh, and he quotes this scripture to them. So he, he goes to the word of God. I just want to point that out. He reads, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? And he quotes out of Isaiah 29. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Stop right there, eyes up here. Whoa. Jesus here exposes the heart of the issue where he says that they worship me with their lips, but their what is far from him? Oh, this is where we zoom back into our congregation this morning, not focusing on them so much, and we realize that the heart of the issue is always an issue of the heart. I'm so glad this is the truth. It's just an issue of your heart. If you're having a struggle, if you're having a problem, if there's a reoccurring issue in your life, I promise you it's related to and directed to your heart's condition. How close is your heart to the Lord at any given time? If your heart has been hypocritical, if there's been an outward showing but an inward distance of your heart, there's gonna be all kinds of evidences of that in your life. Your lips might profess that the Lord is good. We can do all kinds of things outwardly that appear to be spiritual, but our heart is distanced from the Lord. If you've been a Christian for any number of days, you've done this before. Or maybe you can even be in a prayer group, but your heart is far from the Lord. Maybe you're even on staff at a church or serving in a ministry, but you know my heart is far from the Lord. I'm doing the right thing, but I'm not doing it the right way. And I need the Lord to touch my heart. These guys, these Pharisees, these scribes, they were the most religious people in the world. They were the A team of religious people. You couldn't get any better on the outside than these folks. And Jesus said, that's actually really impressive. <laughs> but your heart is what I'm after. Matter of fact, when Saul was, that's not true, when King David was anointed as king, Samuel went to Jesse's house and he began to anoint the best looking son. Remember that? He said, this is the one. And then he continued to anoint and, and, and God said, no, not that one, not that one, not that one. And we receive from Samuel's writings that God looks at the heart, but man judges the outward appearance. That's all we can see is the outside of somebody. You might see somebody who's down and out and pretty scrubby on the outside and struggling as it would look with their lives and say, man, they're all messed up. And yet the Lord would say, oh man, I have fellowship and intimacy with this brother or sister like you wouldn't believe. You judge the outside, it's very easy to do, but God looks at the heart. Or you might look at somebody who's very well-to-do and proper and has a suit and a tie and a collar and a robe and say, oh, that guy's so spiritual. And the Lord says, I haven't talked to that person in years. They've not even looked at me. This is where it might be wise for you and I to just take ourselves off of the seat of judgment towards other people. I just don't wanna do it. Paul said he doesn't even judge his own heart anymore. I don't know what's going on. I, I mean, I deceive myself. Paul said this, I refuse to judge anyone outside of their spirit. I'm not gonna look at the outside. This takes effort, this takes intentionality. This takes trust in the Lord to say, I'm not going to get all bungled up when this person or that person does these things. Well, Jesus says it's a matter of the heart. Look at verse eight, he keeps going. He says, for laying aside the commandments of God, uh-oh, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other th such things you do. And he said to them, all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother. Listen, verse 13, making the word of God of no effect through your traditions, which you've handed down, and many such things you do. Quickly, what Jesus referenced to this group, he said, you guys invented this thing called Corbin. Corbin, they allowed this rule. They said, here's what we're gonna do. Here's a new rule. God gave us some rules. We got more rules. And they said, here's what we're gonna do. If you dedicate all of your wealth and belongings to God, it's a gift, and call it Corbin, that means that whatever you have is God's now, and if you owe something to anybody else, you don't have to give it to them because you gave it to God. Sounds like a tax write-off. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Just give it all to God, and then you don't have to give anything to anybody else. And he references, Jesus does. Do you guys remember where it said in the Bible, honor your father and mother? That's what it says, pretty clear. And do you remember where it says in the Bible, if you don't honor your father and mother, you're not worthy of anything? That's biblical, and that's simple, which, by the way, this isn't necessarily an American tradition, but it is a first century Middle Eastern tradition where they take care of their own. 
mom and dad get old, we're gonna make sure that they're cared for. That's just the way it is. There's no, it's not even a question. There's no retirement homes. There's no, 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 none of those things in, in the Middle East. Instead, they take care of themselves. But these guys came up with a way. Let's just go ahead and give our religious people a way of not being loving to the people around them by donating all of their goods to God, in quotes. Then they don't have... To. Here's the deal with legalism. Legalism and Phariseeism, fake word, is when you and I try and skirt the real issue and make sure that what we do serves our self-interest rather than the interest of God and others. And we become sneaky. And legalism will do this to you and you'll pit yourself against other people. And it's just a dangerous road. Jesus uses this chapter and verse to tell them I'm not impressed. Verse 13, I've got it underlined and noted in my Bible. This, when you do these things, it makes the word of God of no effect. Why? Through your traditions, which you've handed down, many such things you do. And then when he called the multitude, verse 14, to himself, he said to them, hey, Hear me, everyone, and understand. In other words, Jesus, that this is so important. He knows he's gonna die for this fight. He knows the children of Israel will die if they don't figure this out, though, and find where grace is. Verse 15, there's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he entered into the house, away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. Stop right there, eyes up here. Let's also ask about the parable. Jesus said, nothing on the outside coming into you will defile you, but the things come out of you will defile you. And he stops. That's confusing, isn't it? You're like, nothing that goes in defiles me? Aren't there some things in this world that are very dangerous and defiling? Everyone with a brain say amen. There's some things out there that will mess you up. Drugs and alcohol and sexual impurities and lies and what we're gonna call the moral law. Thou shalt not kill or lie or steal or covet. You know if you do those things, you're gonna suffer. But Jesus is saying something here. Guys, don't be so fired up about the things outside. Oh, they're dangerous but it's truly, and Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue, it's the things that come from out of you that are more dangerous. And so when the disciples took him aside privately, and maybe you should do this, do this, and hey, we kind of need some help in this issue. What's really going on? And Jesus, I believe, was blessed at this question. I've fought tons of people over the years about Christianity and the Bible, but every once in a while, I get a person with good questions that wants good answers. And when you have good questions and you want good answers, God will give them to you. If you just wanna fight and wanna reject, I don't got time for that. I don't think the Lord does either. But if you wanna know, he'll tell you. Verse 18, he says to them, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside can't defile him? It doesn't have enough power, he was saying. Verse 19, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Now, contextually, Jesus isn't talking about drugs, alcohol, sexual impurity, and the moral law. He's talking about the traditions of man, specifically. And he's saying those things, when they come in, they don't defile you. As a matter of fact, once they come out of you, then they're defiled. That's biology 101. We're not gonna go there, but you guys can fill in the blanks. You ate that thing, it wasn't a big deal until it's a big deal. And then it's great. Then it's defiled because it came out of you. And he's saying this is indicative of how your heart is. The things that come out of your heart, man, the heart's all messed up until the Lord touches it. Then he lists this list. There's 13 things. I don't have time to expound on each one of them. You can pick your favorite ones and work on them. Look at verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed. And now he lists 13 things. And let me just talk about the first one. Evil thoughts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where sin is born is in our heart, in our mind. When we start to meditate on things, we start to see things, we start to be subjected to things. And right then, out of that particular battle, if you don't take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ, it will germinate. It will then produce fruit. It will then produce death. But I'll just re- read through these quickly. You guys can do a life group study and say, which sins do you struggle with in your life? And Just kidding, don't do that. But in your <laughs> evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Last verse, all these evils come from within and defile a man. Jesus here is getting to the heart of the issue. Saying, guys, you're really concerned about this whole hand washing thing? It's not a big deal. It's not even in the book. You know what is a big deal? Our hearts. And once you become a judge, once you become a legalizer, you begin to minimize these things that Jesus wants to eradicate from our lives. And as Jesus, I believe the disciples, when they heard this, they were slain as well. 
And maybe you heard a struggle in that list of 13 things and evils that come out of your life. Like, oh man, that happens sometimes. I have an evil eye. An evil eye means you're jealous towards somebody or you're combative towards them or judgmental. We all do this. It's an American pastime to be critical of other people. Jesus said, these are the things that come from your heart. And I believe what the Lord wants to do in this group is to heal them and to minister to them, just like in our group. And we're actually out of time, so I'm gonna have the worship team come over and they're gonna lead us in a closing song. But I believe that God's word has enough to stir up within our own hearts and to say to you and to say to me, hey, don't get sucked into the traditions of mankind which make the word of God of no effect. I wanna be a disciple of Jesus Christ that trusts the process, that does the next right thing, that lets God's grace come flow freely through my life and into the lives of the people around me. And I believe you guys do too. This is South Beach Church. I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys are like the Gentiles of all Gentiles. It's amazing. And the Lord wants us to be set free from our own prejudices and from our own legalisms. A couple things I would say in closing before we pray. Maybe even a few things. I don't know how many will come out. Legalism will steal your joy. It's a joy killer. If you're not a joyful person right now, it could be because you're just a legalist. You're a Pharisee. You can see what everyone's doing different than you, therefore it's wrong. I would never do it that way. Man, a lot of people do things differently than I do it. I've come to a point in my life where I'm encouraged by the uniqueness of men and women. Well, that's a cool style. I couldn't pull that shirt off, I would never wear that, but I'm glad you're doing that, that's really cool. Oh, you like that music, that's crazy. I don't like that music at all, that's awesome. Please turn it off. No judgment, no judgment. Legalism will steal your joy. Legalism will also distort the gospel. That's not good. It'll mess people up. They won't understand. People aren't gonna get saved through legalism. No one's getting saved through legalism. No one's gonna run to the party and say, I wanna be a part of that. It doesn't do it that way. Legalism marginalizes Christ and the work that he did on the cross. Oh yeah, Jesus died on the cross, you might say, and he rose from the dead and he accomplished a bunch, but man, if you don't do your part, it might not work for you. What? Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He's done enough. He's done everything. Don't add to his work. Don't add to his word. Legalism will destroy relationships. It'll destroy churches. It'll destroy communities. You and I don't have enough information to be legalists, to be Pharisees, to be judges. Do you trust the Lord enough to have his way in the lives of your brothers and sisters? I do. Maybe instead of judging people, you pray for them. I wanna pray for that person. I just sense maybe something's off. Maybe something's wrong. Maybe they're, they're tiptoeing towards something that's dangerous for them. And maybe it's just a tradition. Maybe it is dangerous. Maybe there is drugs or alcohol or sexual impurity, something the Bible tells you and I who are spiritual, hey, jump in the ring with those men and women and help them in their fight. Don't just let them walk off the edge. Love them. Walk with them. With every truth that God gives us, there's ditches on either side, excess and neglect. These guys, though, when they showed up, minimized what Jesus was doing, minimized who Jesus is. I don't want to do that. And we need God's wisdom. I'm going to have you guys stand. We're going to pray. We're going to sing a song. We're going to be dismissed. Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your continued commitment to us. And we pray, God, that we would be your hands and feet and that you would use us, Lord, to minister to the people of our community. And maybe you're here this morning and you've got so many questions. You're like, well, am I a legalist? Am I a Pharisee? My joy's not very full. I'm always anxious. I'm always upset. I'm always judgmental. I don't want to do those things. Oh, I want to be set free. And maybe today would be the day you say, Lord, just help me. Please forgive me. Help me not to be the way, Lord, that I'm wired, Lord, in a broken heart, a hypocritical heart, a judgmental heart. But what I want to do is I want to be loving and I want to be freeing and I want to be serving. Hey, if you want to be loving and serving and freeing in Jesus' name, would you raise up your hand right now if you just want to be anointed to be that minister? Lord, I want to be that minister. I don't want to be all messed up in my mind. I just don't have enough smarts to do it. So Lord, anoint us, we pray, as we turn the lights low now, and as we sing a song to you, might you cleanse us and heal us. Maybe this morning you can put your hands down. You need prayer. You need to give your life to Jesus Christ. You need to confess some sin. You need to do these things. Whatever it is, may you respond to the Lord during the song. I'll be up here under the screen if you need prayer. Let's sing to Jesus together as one.